Um, could I get, I know that these lights are meant to illuminate me to the best possible degree, but nobody really needs that. Could, <laughs> could we bring these down just a little bit? Oh, you're all so beautiful. <laughs> um, for those of you that are uh, here for something later in the day and uh, just want to keep your seats, my name is Pat Rothfuss. Um, <laughs> And uh, who has been to one of these before? Okay. Um, Jesus, this place is almost full. Um, when I heard that they were going to do the Q&A here in the hall, I went, they can fit 5,000 people in that. And I will feel like I could get 1,000 people, and it means that it would fill like this space right here and I would feel a little sad, <laughs> even though a thousand is a lot of people. So for those of you that haven't been to the afternoon with Pat Rothfuss or whatever we ended up calling this, um, I am gonna do a little bit of q and I'm gonna do um, a little bit, well, okay, let's be honest. People will have the opportunity to ask some questions and then I will tell a story vaguely relating to the topic of that question. <laughs> let's, just, let's just put all of our cards on the table right away. Um, and uh, I also have some stuff that I could read. It kind of depends on what it feels like we're in the mood for here. So, uh, thank you for coming so much. Where should we start? Um, <laughs> oh, oh. That's a very kind thing. I am a little worried if we start out this hour as sort of an interactive adventure, <laughs> things will spiral into the madness and it might trigger off some old teacher instincts that I have where... Uh, like occasionally if I, if I get the wrong sort of response from my classroom, as it were, and they're, they're, they're talking when I'm trying to kind of get something done, I can get real stroppy. Um, so, thank you, I appreciate that compliment. Let's be careful, let's wait, and uh, there are some microphones there. But don't run up to them, because here's what we're gonna do. Oh, spotlights. There's so much good AV here. So, um, uh, so we'll do, <laughs> you can turn those spotlights off now that everyone knows. Um, what we'll do is when we get to the Q&A section of, of this, I'll actually ask people to raise their hands and I will pick a few people that can then go. Otherwise, we'll get like 40 people in the aisles and we'll never do that many questions. And those people will be forced to stand up or I'll have to tell them to sit down. And it's super awkward and I feel real bad about that. So, um, also I'm a control freak. So, <laughs> if we do it my way, then it's really just about keeping me happy. Uh, um... I was talking to somebody recently and they said, I notice that you don't talk about books much anymore on your blog. And I said, well, I don't talk about much of anything on my blog these days. Um, I kind of fell out of the habit of writing them. I go, but when I really have something to say, I say it on Goodreads. I review books there. And I mostly, and although I, I immediately backpedaled and I said, I don't really, review books there. If there's a book that I love, I gush about it there. And if there's a book that I don't, I kind of feel like, eh, about, I maybe don't talk about it because I probably know the person that wrote it. <laughs> or they are a colleague of some sort, or maybe a potential somebody that I might work with in the future. Like if I'm reading a comic, I've just started doing comics a little bit. I don't know how much I'll go back. Uh, I did a Rick and Morty comic. I'm sorry, I pitched that the wrong way for this audience. I did a D&D &D comic. <laughs> there we go. No, no, wait, I could actually get both of those. 
I did a Rick and Morty D&D crossover comic. Um, <laughs> the first issue of which just actually came out on Tuesday. Has anybody seen that yet? I am not, oh, so, wow, right up front here. Um, uh, that's the alternate cover. Oh. <laughs> I haven't even seen this one. I haven't had this one yet. <laughs> that looks badass. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of alternate covers. Uh, and... Uh, I kind of love D&D &D and I love Rick and Morty and so I got to write a comic where I made fun of both of them a lot. <laughs> and it'll be four issue arc um, it, during which at some point I intend to make you cry <laughs> because that is what I do. <laughs> okay, but anyway, so they were saying, so if you don't review books on Goodreads, what do you do? And then I sent them a link to this. Um, I figure this is how we'll kind of get to know each other up here at the beginning of this. Um, who's read Roald Dahl? Maybe when you were a kid, or you saw Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, at least, the movie, the, the one with Gene Wilder, right? <laughs> not, not that I don't love, you know, like Johnny, well, not that I didn't used to love Johnny Depp. <laughs> And not that he didn't do an extremely weird Willy Wonka in the recent one, but come on, Gene Wilder. So I've started reading some of the other Roald Dahl books, kind of assuming that all of them were like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> Motherfucker. Like, oh, no, see, it's like noon. There's probably kids here. I'm sorry, I'm going to be swearing more than anyone else at the convention. <laughs> so, sorry, fair warning, content warning, mature, especially, oh, especially this review, right? <laughs> okay. Um, he wrote a book called SEO Trot, and uh, here's the review I wrote. <laughs> Spoiler alert, fuck this book. That's it, that's the whole review, no. I, uh, <laughs> I wish, oh, I'm gonna maybe start doing that too. Uh, fuck this book, don't read it to your kids. That's the short version. If you want the longer version, settle in. We're gonna have a bumpy ride. Also, there are spoilers here, and cussing, and some indignation, be warned. I should get that before I ever come on stage anywhere, okay? <laughs> All of you have now also been warned. I've always thought of myself as a bit of a Roald Dahl fan. I read the BFG growing up, and I loved it. I watched Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and I loved it. But recently, my love dimmed a little bit when I read James and the Giant Peach, a book that was a serious boatload of meh. It was a nickel's worth of story in a dollar-long book. And don't you dare say to me, oh, it's just a children's book, or, oh, kids don't know any better, or you can't hold YA fiction to the standards of, no, stop, just stop. That's such bullshit that it's an in insult to the word bullshit. <laughs> kids' books should be just as good as any other books. As a matter of fact, they should be held to a higher standard rather uh, than other literature for the same reason that we take extra care with children's food. And the fact is, what you feed your kids is important, and that includes what they put in their heads as well as what they put in their bellies. So let's talk about this book, SEO Trot. In this story, you have Mr. Hopper. He loves two things, the flowers he grew on his balcony and his downstairs neighbor, Mrs. Silver. He is terribly lonely and he's terribly shy. His downstairs neighbor, Mrs. Silver, has a pet tortoise that she adores. The tortoise is named Alfie. He lives on Mrs. Silver's balcony, and Mr. Hoppy is terribly jealous of him. So one day, I mean, your life has got to be kind of a mess to be jealous of a tortoise. Um, <laughs> so one day, Mrs. Silver laments to Mr. Hoppy 
Uh, they talk while on their balconies, you see. She with her turtle, him tending his garden. And she's had Alfie for 11 years, and he's still tiny, and she wishes he would get bigger. I would give anything to make that happen, she says. And Mr. Hoppy gets all Twitterpated hearing this, and so he lies to her and tells her that he knows a magic spell that will help her tortoise grow. And I quote, I beg you to tell me, Mr. Hoppy, I will be your slave for life. And when he heard the words, your slave for life, a shiver of excitement swept through Mr. Hoppy. End quote. <laughs> so he gives her some bullshit he makes up, telling her it's a spell he learned from a Bedouin. And then he goes out and buys a hundred tortoises. And then he builds a long grabber arm of the sort that you would use if you wanted to, say, steal someone's tortoise off the balcony right below yours. And at this point, I thought to myself, he's not doing what I'm thinking, is he? And then I flipped a couple of pages, and I told my son that it was bedtime and that we would finish this book tomorrow. <laughs> Disappointed, he went to bed. I finished the book. And here's what happens. Mr. Hoppy spends the next two months slowly replacing Mrs. Silver's pet with progressively larger tortoises. And Mrs. Silver is amazed by this, and out of gratitude, she marries Mr. Hoppy. And then Mr. Hoppy gives away all the tortoises, including Alfie, Mrs. Silver's pet of 11 years. And do I really need to explain to anyone that this is really fucked up? <laughs> do I feel bad for Mr. Hoppy, this lonely, shy man? Do I empathize with the fact that he loves someone but can't bring himself to tell her? Hell yes, I have been Mr. Hoppy. Sure, I get it but his actions are fucking awful here. <laughs> and their matter-of-factness makes them doubly awful. And, hey there, lads, it seems to say. Love a girl? Here's what you can do. Lie to her, trick her, steal from her, make her obligated to you, and then you get to be in a relationship. And that's not even touching on the subject. To Mr. Mrs. Silver is shown to be a complete fucking idiot who recites a magic spell three times a day to make her tortoise grow and then fails to notice when her beloved pet of 11 years is exchanged for completely different animals, not just once, but several, several times. <laughs> Suffice to say, the next night when my boy asked to read the rest of the story, I deviated from the original script. This was made a little more difficult by the fact that the book was heavily illustrated. <laughs> but even so, I was fairly confident that I could still do better than Dahl's original trick her into marrying you storyline. In my version, in addition to buying a bunch of tortoises and building a tortoise grabber, Mr. Hoppy also goes to the grocery store and buys a bunch of vegetables. He then spends the rest of the week inventing recipes for tortoises and testing them on his new pets, figuring out which ones are the most delicious to tortoises. And then, every night, he uses his long-armed tortoise grabber to lift Alfie up to his apartment where he feeds him delicious food. And, as we all know, when you eat more, you get bigger, right? <laughs> Got a little personal experience there. And he discovers that what Alfie likes best is some of the flowers that Mr. Hoppy grows on his balcony. The flowers that Mr. Hoppy loves. So Mr. Hoppy uses these flowers from his garden in his recipes. I described these to my boy in some detail to kind of pad out the story, because uh, I am like a fantasy author, after all. <laughs> um, and then Mr. Hoppy feeds Alfie every night, and Alfie grows bigger and bigger and bigger, and finally Mrs. Silver is overcome with joy and invites Mr. Hoppy down to her apartment to show off her lovely tortoise. She, think, she thanks Mr. Hoppy for his magic spell and asks him if he'd like to have tea. Over tea, Mr. Hoppy says, Mrs. Silver, I have a confession to make. Yes, she says. That spell wasn't really magic. <laughs> 
he said. I just made it up. Really? Mrs. Silver said. Yes, Mrs. Mr. Hoppy said. I've been feeding Alfie special recipes every night so he would grow bigger. Oh, Mr. Hoppy, Miss Silver said. I already knew that, but I'm so glad you told me yourself. <laughs> you knew, he said. You silly man, she said. The balcony is right outside two huge fucking windows. <laughs> It's just like your balcony. How could I not see you grabbing him every night? <laughs> ah, Mr. Hoppy said, feeling rather embarrassed. <laughs> he thought he was being pretty clever. You're right, of course, I did. You caught me, but I did it because I love you. I knew Alfie was really important to you and I wanted you to be happy. I know that too, Mrs. Silver said. I'm so glad you're finally brave enough to tell me. And then they get married. <laughs> I would have preferred for them to go and get coffee and maybe have a date instead, but there was an actual picture of them getting married in the book, and so I had to leave that part in. Uh, in my version, they also work together to publish a book of recipes for tortoises, and they use that money to start a tortoise park where Mr. Hoppy put his 100 now surplus to requirement pets. <laughs> Can you even imagine what his apartment smelled like? <laughs> but apparently I was pushing my luck there because when I told him the last part, my son gave me a look and he said, did you make that up? <laughs> ah, I said, you're right, of course, I did. You caught me, but I did it because I love you. Okay, maybe let's do a little bit of Q&A here. Um, so, some guidelines for the questions. Um, fucking don't ask about book three when <laughs> book three... I mean, if I knew when it was going to be out, I would have already, like, announced it on social media, you know? So let's skip right over the top of that. We only have an hour. Um, don't ask me questions about my beard because it might be really interesting to you, but it is not something that I deliberately do. Here's an interesting thing that I just consciously became aware of. Don't compliment people on things that they don't actually do. Does that make sense? Hello? Did my mic go dead? I might need a backup microphone. I could try to use my teacher voice. <laughs> the problem with the teacher voice is if I combine it with the dad voice, uh, the people in the front row die. <laughs> um, I, I imagine right, oh, there we go, hold on. Are we just cutting in and out here? Or am I having a stroke? Um, I. I think they're probably gonna, gonna grab me a fresh one uh, back there um, if this one continues to cut out. But now I forgot what I was talking about. No, hold on, I need it from one person. Oh, my beard, right. Don't compliment people on things that they don't actually do deliberately. Um, and, and this is like a real eye-opener. I wish I had realized when I was like 14. Um, you know, like it's not like I sit in a dark room for an hour every day and grow my beard. <laughs> like I get the beard, and, or people assume that this is like a lifestyle thing for me, that like I'm super proud of it. It is literally the only thing you get by being super lazy. <laughs> Like, I don't want to scrape a blade over my face constantly or run like a dog groomer over my own face or do the, go to the, go and get to the beard doing plays. So, <laughs> like, but similarly, you can extend that to other things. If you want to compliment somebody, 
and like they have made a piece of art. You go, oh, what wonderful art. That is a good compliment. If you say, I'm trying to think of a physical characteristic you might compliment other than a beard and it's all bad. <laughs> and that's the point, right? If someone perhaps has a part of their body and you're admiring it, keep that to yourself. Maybe, yeah. I think we can jump right to the end of that whole little discourse. I hope this journey, although somewhat truncated, has been educational for all of us, right? What was I about to do? Q&A. I did not get my coffee before I came up here today because of the traffic. So, um, we're also going to aim more for what I like to think of as popcorn questions as opposed to, um, like, uh, steak and potatoes questions. So, like, something short, sharp. It can also be weird if you want. That's fine. If you ask me something like, where do you get your ideas from? Uh, no offense, but I've answered that one like a hundred times. And if you're really curious, that's cool. But I've given really good answers. And because of the magic of the internet, they're all available in multiple iterations out there. So don't be afraid to ask something a little bit different um, up here. Now that I've paralyzed you all with fear, um, I will do, so I'm going to pick like five people and we'll work through those questions and then I'll do another round of questions if we have time, okay? Say, yes, Mr. Ruffus. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't encourage me because <laughs> if we start getting like a call and response thing going, I will go mad with power. So <laughs> here we will do one, two, three. Um, and long blonde hair, I hope, and blue shirt. And we'll do that for now, and then I will move out of this. So feel free to come up to the microphones, and I'll try to do these in something that is similar to, but hopefully faster than my normal long rambling uh, storytelling style answer of question. Um, also, fair warning, multi-part questions are frowned upon. Like, if your question could technically be an essay question in like a freshman literature class, <laughs> pick, pick your favorite part of your prepared question and ask just that one with just one question mark at the end of it if for no other reason that I will not be able to hold four different questions in my head and answer them in sort of an orderly fashion without my coffee yet today. So, we'll start here. What is the meaning of Bost's name for Kvoth Reshi? Ooh, okay. Um, so, good question. Uh, let's wander over <laughs> here. Uh, <laughs> Let me say, I am glad that you are curious. I am glad that you uh, are engaged in the story enough to, be, to want to know that. But, and, and I, I'm, I'm not being snarky here, because I, I want you to be curious about that. But also, if I wanted you to know yet, I would have put that in the book. Um, and so I, I, I'm not going to say no spoilers up here because I will happily field questions about characters or the world or the books, but things that I am deliberately sort of keeping close to my chest, I will say, thank you very much for that question. It's a great question, but I will go over here now and I will not answer it. Yeah. Hi. I love the way you talk about love. Oh. And I'm getting married in a month. Hey! Um, do you have any marriage advice for us? I do. <laughs> oh, oh, oh no. You've done a terrible thing. You've given me an open-ended question. Everybody else, maybe sit down. Uh, no, you, you can... 
you can stay there, but just be aware. This is going to take me a little minute, right? <laughs> First off, yeah, you go ahead, like really sit down on the floor. Um, make yourself comfy. Uh, yeah, go ahead and grab your seat back too. Even you, if that's your seat right there, go ahead. I'm not going to feel bad about that. This is a good question. First off, I will say uh, thank you because... Like, if I look back over the blogs that I've written or the things that I have said or what I've talked about in interviews that I remember and that I in any way feel proud of, um, I, I am probably proudest of when I actually get around to talking about important things. And I think that love is a much neglected subject these days. Um, it's something that we maybe don't think about enough or talk about enough or work towards enough um, in all of its many facets because love is a hell of a messy word. Um, you know, the Greeks had like four or five different ways of referring to love. You had eros, which was the sexy love, and philius was um, the love towards a family member. Agape was sort of a weird nebulous concept which I have heard referred to as that love which upon conferring it instills worth which is a cool idea <laughs> um, there's also a type of love that you feel for like pets and children um, uh, the Greeks I mean because like who has felt that love right it's like, oh, a puppy, oh, sweetie, a bunny, hun. It's like, you love it, but it's fucking useless. <laughs> and that's okay, that is still a kind of love, but if that's the sort of love you feel towards, say, the person you're getting ready to be married to, that will lead to problems. <laughs> so maybe make sure you're on the same page by, so here's, here's what I will say in terms of advice. Talk about love. And that is not something that we are trained to do a lot, especially um, if you're a dude, especially if maybe you are from the Midwest or from certain parts of the country where that sort of conversation is not really promoted or valued. I certainly never had a lot of deliberate discussions of it growing up. I knew I was loved and I knew my parents loved me but like, that was, it was a lot of implied conversation. First piece of advice, implied things will fuck your relationship right up. Forever, 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 and you will die. Okay? So don't do that. What you do is you do not implicit communication because here's what my dad used to say. Now, this is a test to those of you to see who can speak Midwestern. <laughs> My dad used to say, is there any of that milk left in the fridge? Now, does anybody have a guess as to what he meant with that statement? No, 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 no. This is not anarchy. <laughs> we are having hands raised. I will say, what do you think? The, the, here's a good guess. Did you drink all of the milk? Yeah? Did you steal the last of my milk? I would like some milk. I would like some milk. You, where are you from? Oh, see? I was curious. You ever, you ever been to the Midwest? It's, but, but here's the thing. This is just a different type of discourse. Within the tight circle of my family, everyone knew what this meant. Because he knew if there was milk in the fridge. He was not a fucking idiot. But this was, he didn't want to ask because in our little culture and in the Midwest in general, if you ask someone for something, they really have to give it to you. And so asking is a burden. And this, don't do this, advice piece number two. This is a shitty way to arrange things, okay? <laughs> Because you need to be able to ask questions and be happy with any answer that comes back. Otherwise, it's not a question. If you're like, hey, do you want to go to a movie with me? And they say no, 
you weren't really asking. And if they say no, and you're like, I hate you, (laughs) it wasn't a question. And what maybe you should have said is, I would really like to go to a movie with you, explicit statement. Um, If you would like to come to a movie with me, that I think would be fun for us, explicit statement. Are you interested in doing that with me? Explicit statement and a question. But then you need to be able to let the other person say, God, I hate Michael Bay. (laughs) Um, We can all understand that, right? (laughs) We all really, some part of us in some secret corner of our heart hate Michael Bay, right? In this moment, I think we can all come together, all of us as a group, and admit. You know, I'll let you get it off your chest. You can say it right now, we'll say it all together. Because I'm going mad with power. You can say, we'll all say, you know, I do hate Michael Bay. One, two, three, no, I do hate Michael Bay. See, there we go, see. Somebody at Lionsgate right now is drafting an email. (laughs) Um. (laughs) The dramatic sting. Explicit communication is really good, not just for people getting married, folks. You gotta be able to say what you really mean, because the way that my dad would have asked to go to a movie would be to say, I heard that new Michael Bay movie is out. (laughs) And the problem with implicit communication, we got three people with three different fair opinions and interpretations of that statement. And then, but here's the thing, he would have then been kind of angry if his simple request was not honored but it was not clear, you know? Hey, I hear that Michael Bay movie is out. And and it's like, oh, really? Oh, neat. Good junk. The end of the conversation. And then he's like, what the fuck? Why haven't you answered me? And the other person is like, why are you angry? You haven't asked me a question. And if you think this only happens in the Midwest, you are terribly wrong, and you probably do this yourself. Who has done this? Who has had it done to them? Okay, now those of you that only raised your hand the second time, you need to spend some time in a quiet place (laughs) and think and just sort of reflect on your life and realize that no, right? (laughs) That you do it too, even if you don't realize it. This is a skill you have to build up. Um... There is a quote in the book, in Wise Man's Fear, where Quoth talks about love. And I'm gonna shame myself by admitting that I can actually do it, probably word for word. He says, anyone can love a thing because. That is as simple as putting a penny in your pocket, but to love a thing despite, to know its flaws, and love it anyway, that is rare and beautiful and pure and perfect. And I'm gonna ask, no, 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 no. Although I appreciate the sentiment, but, and, and don't, this is not, this, this is a weird question. Were you planning on using that in the ceremony or anything? <laughs> What's that? I no. <laughs> no, no, I was just checking. Um, because, see, what you maybe thought I was asking there, what you thought I was implying was, hey, would you, I'd feel kind of good if you did that. But what I was really saying is, are you planning on that? Period. The end. Explicit question. Because if you had said yes, I would have modulated my tone a little bit more here. 
because many people have told me they have used this in their wedding ceremonies. And the problem is this sentiment is attractive, is absolutely part of our cultural landscape, and it is deeply unhealthy and wrong, (laughs) right? Like, and those of you that have read the books, right, Quoth is, what the fuck does Quoth know about healthy relationships? (laughs) Really? This is not, and I, I think as I wrote it and I'm like, oh, this is a good quote. People are going to love this. People are going to get like a tattoo of this. People are going to like cross stitch this. And I was right. And people <laughs> have used this in their wedding ceremonies and ever since. I, and, but even as I wrote it, I'm like, oh, this is so good. I hope people don't internalize this too much because taken at face value, it's sweet. And if you look underneath the surface, it real bad for you. (laughs) Because I'm looking down how much time I have here. Because it sort of implies that the person you're in a relationship with who they are or what they do really actually doesn't matter very much. What matters is like what you feel for them. And that's not how it works. Actually, who you are in a relationship and who the other person is and what they do is actually super important. I hope I'm not blowing anyone's mind here. <laughs> but I, I, the, the fact is, the fact that everyone loves that quote means that you can, you can lose the danger in it in the appealing phrasing and the romantic sentiment. But the fact is, you should love someone because you should be willing to forgive or overlook flaws. But loving someone who is nothing but flaws is not a somehow even double better magical good love. (laughs) Like, loving somebody or continuing to love somebody or like putting extra effort in just because, you know, you like the other person is maybe doesn't behave well that's super, don't know, that don't, don't feel like, it's like, I am doing it, and this is, I have the best love, because that's really bad for you, you know? You need to be honest with the person, and say, hey, you do this, and it's bad, and it makes me feel bad. Or sometimes you need to say, oh, you are maybe not the person that I thought, and you don't treat me well, and now I'm going to have to leave this relationship. Sticking to it does not make you noble, and that doesn't make your love somehow holy. Sorry to get a little real here, right? (laughs) Um, But, and again, this is not news to any of the women in the audience, (laughs) but I'm going to talk a little bit directly to the guys because this is a lesson many of us don't learn because we're not treated as badly as the women. But sometimes the best thing you can do in a relationship is leave. Women know this, unfortunately, because they've been forced to learn this. Guys, sometimes, especially if you kind of have a lot of sweetness and gentleness in your heart, you can trick yourself into being treated real bad. Um, That goes for everyone, but sometimes I think a lot of guys in our culture are not trained up into having the same sort of emotional maturity that women are, because as a culture, we're really kind of a mess. So I'm saying, hey, if you're like me and you hit 30 without having to think about a lot of things real hard, congratulations, you're a white man, you know? (laughs) Um, 
and you've been sort of playing the game on easy and you've been just kind of button mashing your, your way <laughs> through a lot of these encounters. And then suddenly you hit fucking Sephiroth and you're like, God damn it. How do I do the jump roll? I haven't been practicing. And just to make it clear, the jump roll is like the explicit communication. <laughs> Sephiroth would be like a real important relationship to you. The video game is life. <laughs> just to be really clear, those of you that aren't into extended metaphors. <laughs> I forget what your question was. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna assume that I've answered it. <laughs> and I'm just gonna wander over here. Thank you, that was a great question. I really appreciate it. Over here. Uh, the way I've heard you talk about it, I can tell that you really love swearing. Yeah. Uh, what are some of your absolute favorite swears, both profanity and non-profanity category? Uh, oh, so I'm not. Sorry to the interpreter. Uh, Non-profane swears. Is that what you said? Both profane and non-profane. Yeah, stuff like you know, Dana is shouting "blackened body of God," and you know. Well, that's totally profane in the world, um, uh, because that's it's blasphemy. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, profane really matters on where you live. Um, and I do love to cuss. They've actually shown that uh, people who swear have less stress. Um, there's a lot of studies on swearing, like psychological and like neurobiological studies that show um, like really interesting things about people that swear or swear more. Um, I do feel a little guilty about it sometimes because I was kind of brought up in a no swear household, which is probably why I do it so much now because I, <laughs> I'm like, ha, 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 I am not, now I am a grown, now I am a grown up, and now I can swear and no one can stop me. Um, and um, um, one of the, uh, one of my favorite in-world cusses that Bast says at one point is he says, on powen. He just like spits it out. He's like, on powen. And what, it mean, what that means is shoe iron, which like to a fairy creature is like, is real bad, you know? But to anybody else, it's like, what, uh, shoe iron? You know, like what, why, why, why is that something that you cuss out? Um, um, my other, I mean, motherfucker is a great word. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just got a lot going on in it. Like, it's got, it's got good mouth feel. It's got a lot of fricatives in it. It's iambic. <laughs> like, fuck is a great invective, right? You know, I get to tell a cute kid story now. <laughs> Who has kids? Okay, so, um, hope you didn't bring them, sorry. Uh, uh, if you've had kids, and if you're a cusser, you know that um, if you're in, say, the car and the kid's in the back seat, there's some words that kids pick up more easily than others. Um, and, you know, in the same way that uh, there are uh, birds that can mimic human speech, I'm not making the joke yet. Um, this, is, this is a real thing. Um, in, uh, they, uh, birds that mimic human speech pick up some words or types of words much more easily uh, because of the phonetics and because of the emphasis. And they, in the Kama Sutra, it, there's a brief section uh, where they taught, yeah, I'm going to bring it around. Just trust me. <laughs> Just trust me. They talk about how um, uh, they needed to not, like in these, in these fabul fabulous harems or in uh, like brothel is the wrong word, but 
they would have to move these fancy birds away from the sex places because the birds would mimic the sounds because they are very simple sounds, said very emphatically and kind of repeated a lot. Um, That's not from the Kama Sutra. I don't think they had a chapter about bird fucking in the Kama Sutra. (laughs) Did I make this up from my book and then not have it in there? This happens sometimes. (laughs) No, 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 no. This is from a book, and I can't remember the title of the book, but the chapter heading was Birdsong at Morning. Can anybody help me out? Is this book called When God Was a Woman? Fuck it. (laughs) Okay, so, fuck is a great invective. You got a kid in the back seat. You do something wrong. You say, fuck. And in the back seat, what does your kid say? Fuck. (laughs) Fuck. 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 Like a little chirping frog. (laughs) Now, uh, my girlfriend Sarah would always panic and she'd be like, oh, uh, don't, 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 which you never do. You can't stop a behavior that way. Instead, what you do is I would say, oh, frog? And he would go, fuck. I go, frog? Did you see a frog? Fuck. Oh, fork. You eat with the fork. Fork. <laughs> Now, fork is actually harder. It's got more phonemes in it. Um, But I was actually sitting and playing a game with my two little boys, uh, Subnautica, if you're curious. It's a great exploration game. Uh, Not a lot of violence, although it's a little spooky if your kids are young and sensitive. And so my, my littler boy leans over to my older one and whispers something. And my older one says, hey. And then they're both like, and Oot, the older of the two, says, he said a bad word. And my littler, who is four, starts to cry. <laughs> and so I like pick him up and I have him on my lap and I'm, I'm like, hey, sweetie, like what's, what's the matter? And he's just, and he goes, I'm really sad, which is great we've taught him to talk about his emotions. So that's not a training I received at a young age. So he doesn't make up some bullshit or he doesn't just have a freak out. He, he's, like, he's like, you know, what's, what's going on? You know, I'm real sad. And so I'm crying. You probably could have figured that out, dad. <laughs> and nevertheless, you have told me to express my emotions. Um, and I go, where is your sadness coming from? And he just, he cries, and he goes, I like to swear. (laughs) I like to swear. And I'm like, oh, sweetie, guess what? I like to swear, too. You've heard me swear, right? He's like, yeah. And then my older boy goes, He goes, you know, it's like they pick the words that feel the best in your mouth, and then they said you can't say them. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, kind of, kind of. And we sat and we talked about how it's not really bad to say a particular word, but it depends on who you're around, and some people's feelings will be hurt, or it can be rude depending on where you are. Um, Like maybe in an opera hall (laughs) in front of a bunch of people who maybe didn't know what they were getting into today. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to assume that I've answered your question. More than adequately. So, I understand you wrote Rin in Numenera. Yes. And I, best party member, clearly. Aw, thank you. What do you think happened to her between when she leaves and when she comes back? Or... Uh, 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 We'll be careful with our spoilers. Okay. But, yes? Or, if she doesn't leave, what do you think would happen if 
she's, you know, went to the orphanage in the ninth world. Oh, I, I know exactly what would happen. Um, so what, what he's talking about here, I'm sorry, your name is? Graham. Graham? Yeah. Uh, what Graham is mentioning here, uh, for those of you that don't know, although this is probably an audience there, are more people than normal would, um, there is a role-playing world and system called Numenera. Uh, Monty Cook did it. Uh, it's a real, real good, um, both in terms of its system and its world building. But there was also a video game where I threw my hat in with uh, the people doing it because the guy writing it was the same guy who wrote uh, Planescape Torment, one of arguably one of the best games ever, although I am an old, and so many of the youngs out there will not ever have heard of that game. So I said, I would come in and I would write a character, and I proposed Rin. And now I can talk about this a little more openly, because when I was doing interviews about the game, it hadn't come out yet, and I didn't want to spoil anything. Um, first off, I'll say, if you're into narrative, and you maybe like video games, um, <laughs> Numenera might be your jam. Um, if you've ever played a game and you get to interact with another character and you get three dialogue options and one of them is to quit the dialogue <laughs> and one of them is aggressive speech that necessitates a fight and the third option is dumb <laughs> and you just sat there and I'm like, I quit. I, in, I initiate combat with this rando or I say the dumbest thing that would never normally come out of a human being's mouth, <laughs> and that has irritated you, maybe try a game like Numenera, where at various points I had like six dialogue options to choose from, and they were varied and subtle and actually affected the game. Um, just to say. So uh, they put together a real dream team for this project, there was like Chris Avalone and people who have done like video games for forever. And I was in the room with them and they were talking about what games or like what the story was going to be and what the characters were going to be and what the world was like. And, and they all sort of pitched their characters and they're like, here's this, you know, and, uh, you know, a nano, which is sort of like a wizard, but with old, like forgotten technology. And there was this person and a living machine and, uh, you know, and uh, whatever, and all these, like, oh, and he can do this and that. And I'm like, so you guys told me that you really wanted this to be a story that centered around choice and how it affects the world and what it means to be a human being. So I want to make a character that doesn't, that isn't an asset in combat at all, I want you to meet her early in the game and she is a little lost 12-year-old girl and she's scared and she doesn't know where she is and you can take her with you or you cannot. And if you take her with you, she's going to eat up one of your companion slots and so you don't get a magical cyber wizard for that slot to help you in combat. But if you really want to have three, like, kick-ass combat members, you have, to, you have to find somewhere to put Rin. Um, and, so, and so I pitch this character, and then I go, here's what I imagine her arc would be uh, if you take her through the story. And it was the little nuts. And they're like, okay, yeah. And I'm like, no way you're going to let me do this. No way. I'm like, I did fall in with the right group of storytellers because they let me take this weird run at a character. Um, so I was really happy with how Rin turned out. Um, I learned a lot about collaborating and writing video games, which is part of the reason that I took that particular gig, because I want to be good at writing video games for when I get a chance to do maybe a King Killer one. Um, so, uh, the question was, what do you think happens to it, or do you know what happens to her, or what do you think happens to her? And I'm like, I know what happens to her. I know where she goes. I know everything about her backstory. I know where she came from. I know all of that. I don't need to guess, but I can't tell you. Um, 
Uh, so, good question. I, I had my own headcanon. I just I wanted to know if it was right. I want to say your headcanon is totally valid, whether or not it matches up with what I think. Okay? That goes for everybody, for every form of art out there. Uh, thank you very much. So now I've got... Five minutes left. We can maybe do a couple more. Uh, let's see some hands. I'll grab one or two more. Um, I'm just looking around because I want to get some variety into this. We are so white. Um, okay, so you. Um, yes, I know. I see him. I am not dumb. <laughs> I'm just picking a few more so they can make their way to the mic while I'm answering that question. So, also, somebody from the back, yellow hat in the air, and, um, and yes, you right there in the middle, I will do yours too. Okay, so, uh, question. After, your ex after the experience you had writing for Torment Tides of Numenera, besides King Killer, what other games would you want to write for? What other games would I want to write for? I would help them do a good Fallout game if they wanted that. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. A lot of times my performances aren't recorded. That was not a polite thing to say. Yeah, the truth hurts, Bethesda. Um, <laughs> that said, I mean, the, what Bethesda has done, by and large, they, they have made some pretty playable games. And, oh boy, that's damning with faint praise, isn't it? <laughs> I've played the hell out of those games, but anybody who's watched my live streams has also seen the frothing rage that, that wells up in me at the missed storytelling opportunities when there were even storytelling opportunities. So, like, yeah, like Bethesda. Oh, Jesus Christ, there's probably people from Bethesda in the audience. <laughs> they don't have a booth this year? I wonder why. Oh, uh, no! <laughs> oh. God, no, 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 no. That was a, I, I am sorry. That is really bitchy. And I just, the problem, I am really sorry. That's, that's bad behavior because you guys are a really good audience and you laugh at what I say. I'm going to sort of go for a cheap joke every now and again. I want to say the original Fallout, when they adapted it from Fallout 2 and they made Fallout 3, the VATS system, the way they adapted it was true goddamn genius. So playable, like so tactical while still being like, like actually engaging and maintaining the tension of combat. They do real good things. Hey Bethesda, I do real good story. You wanna get some of my peanut butter up in your chocolate? <laughs> Dear everyone, I am so sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I have maybe answered your question, but either way, I'm coming over here now. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, because I keep hearing different things over the last like, couple of years, what's the status of like a TV, book to TV or book to movie? Um, there is a deal with Lionsgate. For my, for my main stuff, uh, the King Killer books, uh, we have a deal with Lionsgate. I've been working with them for a thousand years, it feels like. Um, there's a TV show and a movie, both, quote unquote, in development. That is the phrase that I've been told I can use because it means anything. <laughs> um, John Rogers is my showrunner. He is a geek all the way down 
to his bones and he's brilliant. He did leverage, he did the librarians. He's working on the TV show and I could not be more delighted. Um, uh, Ramey is right now uh, talking with us about the movie. Um, that has been sort of, that's, that's out there in the ether. That knowledge exists so I can acknowledge it here. Ramey is a super nice guy too. Like he came to me and I, part of me was like, Ramey? You know, I'm like, when he does a thing, he does it all as the thing that it should be. Anyone who's seen Evil Dead, Evil Dead knew what it was and then was that 1,000%. <laughs> And that shouldn't be King Killer, but if he can figure out what King Killer is and do that there, that would be kind of awesome. But he came into the room and he asked me six hours of questions. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh, he really wants to understand what's going on here. So yeah, uh, there's all of that stuff is going on, period. Um, <laughs> in conjunction with my new best friend, uh, Lynn manuel Miranda. <laughs> Who is signed on as a sort of consultant, uh, resident musicer and uh, president of the Don't Fuck It Up committee. <laughs> which he actually said in a meeting, he says, I just kind of want to be president of the Don't Fuck It Up committee because I really like these books. <clears throat> and when he said that, I felt a weight lift from my heart <laughs> because I realized I should not be president of that committee. I should be on the committee. Um, but like knowing that he, he cared and he wanted to help with that was really reassuring to me. So that's not really news that's been out there for a while, but for those of you that didn't know, if you don't know, now you know. Uh, there you go. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, so oh, oh, hold on. I have just hit zero hour here. The, I, the red light is flashing here. Let's, no, I'm going to do, hit, hit me real quick. I was just going to say, you seem to always be involved in a bunch of cool projects. Just curious if there's anything that you're super pumped about right now. Right now, the big exciting thing is the Rick and Morty comic because I've been working on it for months and it just came out. For those of you that are interested, but you don't have it yet or you didn't know, I'm doing a signing today at four in the thing <laughs> at a booth. It's on the sixth floor. <laughs> and I, I, it's at the convention center. <laughs> Uh, sixth floor of the convention center, it's the Oni booth, booth number six, zero, something, something, something. I put it on my blog. <laughs> it's there for you if you want to see it. Also, I'll probably tweet about it, but that's in a couple hours, that's the next place I'm going. So if you want to pick it up, they will have copies there. Apparently it's been selling out of comic shops. I wouldn't be surprised if it's sold out at the con. So if you do want to get a copy, I'm going to go there and sign them at four and I might see some of you there. Uh, real quick, real quick, I'm over time, but I'll answer yours because I... It might be a little bit too meat and potatoes, but I'm Midwestern, so it's a hard habit to break. Um, you're a teacher, and I'm a teacher. Oh, you gotta jump right to the question. Yeah, so um, you talk a lot, and you use as your teacher, as a teacher, to uh, draw attention to the things that are bad in the world that need attention. And I'm wondering to what extent do we owe ourselves as teachers and our students to draw attention to things that bring joy and gratitude. Sorry. I will say, uh, watch me, I can do it. They're, they're getting ready to clear it out. They're like, Rothfuss, we're gonna, we're gonna use that big hook to get you off the stage. So here's what I'll say. This is a great question. These are dark fucking times in the world, everyone. We all know it, unless you're deaf, dumb, and blind. You owe it to yourself and to the world and to people who do not have the ability to protect themselves to do something. You do not owe it to the world to be constantly miserable and you should still try to find joy in your life. You need to do both though. 
that's as much as I should do. Um, thank you so much for coming.